welcome to Silax, the podcast where we talk about scientific developments and technological changes in Luxembourg. And in today's show, we talked to Professor Emma Szymanski at LCSB. She is the head of the Environmental Chem Informatics Group and told us a lot about unknown chemicals, research, analytics, and different implications for our health as well. She also mentioned a lot about open science and the exchange of information, as well as different databases that she uses in her work. Hello and welcome to Silax. Our guest today is Associate Professor and Head of Environmental Chem Informatics Group at LCSB, Professor Emma Szymanski. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. First of all, it's you're the first person from LCSB to talk to us, so this is already cool. And I know that I've been kind of putting it away a little bit because there are just too many words and too many terms and too many things that are very difficult for me as a layman to understand. So I think that we're just going to kind of stay on the surface today, not so much get into very much detailed discussion because it's it's complicated for us laymen. So first of all, let's start with the group you're heading, because it's chem informatics. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah, so it's the group of environmental chem informatics, and it combines the three key words that are most important to me and also uh, define my research probably the best for the last uh, several years. You don't even want to think about the numbers anymore. Um, so I, I was actually trained as an environmental engineer and a chemist. So this comes the environmental uh, and the chemistry interest. Um, and the informatics comes in the chem informatics uh, in dealing with the computational complexity of both the environment and the chemicals that we deal with. So this was my motivation for choosing the group name and it still holds today. So informatics, as we all know, computers, informatics, software, but really the specific focus is on the exchange of information in chemistry. And also analysis as such using computers. Yes, using computers, so data analysis as well. We also do experimental analysis in the group. So we have mass spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometers in the group that record the analysis for us and the chem informatics is then interpreting the results from these instruments. So you've just mentioned the other term that I wanted to understand a little bit. So the mass spectrometry and mass spectrometers, what is that? So a mass spectrometer, uh, if we want to break it down, is uh, is basically our fingerprinting technology. So if you're thinking about the detective uh, going after DNA and the fingerprints of, uh, of criminals, then we're using the mass spectrometer to go after the fingerprints of the chemicals. Um, so we'll take a sample of the environment. This could be soil, it could be water, it could be human samples, it could be blood, it could be... Uh, Feces, the least attractive sample. Uh, we can also do wastewater, which is a mix of everything, of course. And then we do some sample prep. We inject this in the mass spectrometer, um, get a lot of signals out on the other side, and then the informatics starts. Uh, how can we decode? And the nice thing about mass spectrometry is like your individual fingerprint. It gives you information about uh, the chemicals, but it's not necessarily as individualized as humans. So some chemicals can have very similar fingerprints, but they fragment in different ways. This tells us about the structure. And then the fun part starts. So actually knowing what you know and what you don't know in the sense exactly. that there is a lot of knowns, but the problem is with the unknowns, isn't it? Yes. And it's actually just like a criminal search, right? If your detective is... Uh, is looking in the database, then you first you'll look for the database of known criminals. Uh, obviously, we hope our chemicals are not all criminals, but uh, there are databases out there, mass spectral libraries that record the fingerprint. So we can look up these fingerprints and see if our chemicals match. And you can either have the databases that you've done in-house, same instrument, looking identical, or we can use more generic databases that look very similar, but not necessarily identical. These are the knowns, like you were saying. These are the chemicals we know about. Uh, and then, yes, we've got the unknowns as well. Okay, I can see you're smiling. So is that something you're more interested in, to look at the unknowns? Yeah, the focus of my research has generally been the unknowns. Uh, absolutely. So a, a library lookup, uh, I mean, targeted chemical analysis is is its very own field. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of researchers working on it. There's plenty of challenges. But the unknown is even more challenging uh, because they're, you know, we have this fingerprint, but we have no idea what it matches to. And then we, we're using the automatic methods to try and uh, disentangle the information and put together the pieces of the structure. Why not uh, knowing? I mean, it should be easy in a way, right? Let's say we're talking about water. 
hopefully, I mean, not in the sense that there is some pollutant that you don't know about, but in general, we know what we introduce to water. Why can't we just, if we take a sample, know what is inside? already. So uh, this is where the fun starts. Uh, theoretically, we should know, um, but the biggest chemical databases out there contain uh, hundreds of millions of chemicals, and even that doesn't cover the entire chemical space. So we cannot actually enumerate all the chemicals out there right now. And even given that this largest database has hundreds of millions of entries, they all transform when they hit the environment or when they come into humans as well. So you then have this transformation factor on top of it. So the chemical gets modified, the fingerprint will change a bit, and then the whole challenge starts again. So then we have to predict how they would be modified, what this could then look like, what would the fingerprint look like? It's a challenge that will keep us interesting. Yeah. Why don't we have the, the, the list of chemicals? Is it because we keep creating new ones or is it more because what you mentioned that they just go through our bodies or, or get exposed to other factors? We keep creating new ones. So not only have we not, uh, let's just say, not been able to identify everything that's in natural products, so identifying, you know, the active ingredients in, for, for instance, uh, traditional Chinese medicine is a huge field of work and uh, very little is known. Very little is also known about the mixture combination. But yes, uh, also industry is producing more and more chemicals. So you, you can see the, the CAS registry, which is actually a closed registry, um, has gone up from only tens of millions uh, probably 20 years ago to now over 180 million chemicals. So that's just the rate at which things are being produced. You just mentioned that the CAS registry is closed, right? There are also the open source ones. First of all, before yes. you tell us a little bit about the open source, why are there closed registry, registries and open ones? Is it someone wants to hide something or is it just like scientific community doesn't want to share the knowledge? What's the reason for that? So it's uh, closed because they want people to pay the license to help fund the efforts. I think that's that's the simple way of saying it. Um, so it, this decision was made many years ago before open science was the profile that it was. Um, you can see, for instance, fields like genetics that have been very open. They've actually made huge leaps forward in the science because they've shared all that data very early. And chemistry has actually been held behind for many years because that information is closed away. With chemistry, we also have the additional factor that a lot of people, um, or at least the industry, consider this to be confidential business information. The chemicals that they're producing is how they make the money. Uh, pharmaceutical industry, it's the same thing. They also want to protect their knowledge. Uh, and there's been act actually no regulation to ensure that that knowledge is transferred to environmental regulators to ensure that these chemicals are safe for the environment. And that's the case for the whole world or other countries that are more regulated? Well, uh, there are lots of countries that are regulated, but there's still little regulation to enforce the freedom of information. Uh, so the the companies are forced to report uh, or usually regulated to report to the central agencies, but there's no requirement for those central agencies to report to the public or to share that information. So it's still a big challenge. Yeah, absolutely. But then what happens that, that you we can still have the open source ones? The, it, yes, um, this means what? That you actually look at these chemicals only later when they are already in the environment and then you identify them. So it's a kind of a reverse engineering thing. Or you are, which sources are you using for that? So we use many different sources of information on, on many different levels. I'm going to nominate PubChem as uh, the quickest one to introduce. They're the largest open chemistry database out there right now. Um, they've got 111 million chemicals and PubChem is actually compiled from uh, over 840 different contributors. So this means that uh, people can contribute their knowledge to PubChem. They can contribute just the chemical structures. They can also contribute a lot of uh, extra information. And this, uh, over time, this means that PubChem has uh, built uh, or been building from, I think, in 2010, it was 25 million to now the 111 million that it is. I actually contribute through uh, three or four different sources to PubChem. Uh, so as my own individual research group, but also through a couple of other organizations that I work with. And so, yeah, they, they have a very good system to help people contribute the knowledge. And as people become aware of this, they're more willing to contribute as well. Yeah. It's used by millions of users a month now. So, You mentioned PubChem, and I know about the quiz uh, question that you prepared that it's related to this. So just to have a small break before we continue our discussion, could you ask the question to our listeners? Yeah, so the, the pub quiz question for today is uh, if you can have a guess how many uh, PFAS chemicals, according to the latest definitions, are in the PubChem database of 111 million chemicals. Okay, perfect. And I have to ask you still, what are PFAS chemicals? 
Yeah, so PFAS are a great example about regulation because these are um, chemicals that we all know very well in our daily life. We probably couldn't think or think we couldn't live without them anymore. So perfluorinated substances, so it's per and polyfluoroalkyl uh, substances. That's what PFAS stands for. Um, these are actually what's used, for instance, in Teflon. Um, they're used in a lot of the, um, the rain repellent, so they're both oil and water repellent. So they're used in a lot of uh, clothing, textiles, stain repellent, uh, many, many uses out there. The older PFAS like PFOS and PFOA are now very, very strictly regulated because they're accumulating in the environment. And there's a great push at the moment for them to be regulated as a class of chemicals. And there's a great debate in the community going on right now how many chemicals will actually be affected. And this latest definition of PFAS um, have actually reduced the definition to be any um, chemical that contains a CF2 or a CF3 group or longer um, connected PFAS moiety together. So why is the definition evolving? Because there are certain groups that want to still have the, the freedom of no regulation. There are exactly there are people who, uh, if you regulate, uh, industry is very creative and will find a way around the regulation. They'll redesign the chemicals. So it was at first it was thought that the long chain PFAS, so um, as you say, eight, nine, ten of these CF2 atoms joined together, that they were problematic for the accumulation. Uh, so people started making PFAS out of two times short chain, and then it turned out that you need to double the amount to get the same effect, and the end result for the environment was almost the same. In, in very rough terms, obviously, there's a slight difference. So even as you chopped it down into smaller pieces, um, you need to double the amount to get the effect and you ended up with the same concentrations in the environment. The reason they've updated the definition now to be the very small piece is, again, like I mentioned, these chemicals transform as soon as they hit the environment. And it turns out that uh, TFA, the very smallest bit, so trifluoroacetate, um, is becoming one of these very problematic chemicals in the environment because it gets everywhere. It's very mobile. Um, a lot of the PFAS break down to form it and it's it's literally everywhere. Okay, so it's really great the comparison you made in the very beginning of the podcast about the criminals and, and chasing and de detective work because it's yet another example where people are trying to regulate in order to prevent certain Uh, certain results and then of mm -hmm. course the creativity of, of the others for good or for worse depends how you look at it um, yep. plays a, a big role as well yeah absolutely okay coming back to what you mentioned so that the fact that you focus more on the unknowns so if you take a sample i don't know mm -hmm. whichever sample we, we will be talking about how many knowns and unknowns do you normally identify in it Yep. So let's just nominate a wastewater sample, for instance, because uh, this is a it's a really nice population summary. So you've basically got uh, a summary of industry and uh, people around an area. It's quite a complex sample, um, but we had some good numbers on one of these. That's why I'll use that example. If if we have a typical wastewater sample, we can generally identify hundreds. If we're very lucky, thousands of chemicals in there, but usually in the high hundreds range. Um, and the unknowns are around about 10,000 or more chemicals. So You can already see we've got two orders of magnitude difference there. We're going from hundreds of known points to uh, tens of thousands of unknown points. And then, of course, we have to scale that to the chemical knowledge that's out there. We've got 111 million in PubChem, and this is several orders of magnitude more than the number of signals that we're seeing in our mass spectrometer. Of course. But then uh, I also understood that what you do with such a sample, let's say, is the non-targeted analysis, right? So you're not trying to find a specific chemical. You're kind of analyzing everything. Yeah, exactly. So we'll end up with uh, around about 20,000 signals, plus or minus. Some chemicals can give multiple signals. That's why it collapses down to around about 10,000 unknowns, plus or minus. And then, yes, we use this non-targeted screening. We get all of these masses out of the mass spectrometer, and then it's our job to try and find out what chemical could belong to these mass uh, signals that we have. And sometimes you can tell it's highly likely to be exactly one. Sometimes it will be several candidates. Sometimes you can't find any candidates in even the largest databases. So we also, for efficiency reasons, PubChem is great, it's huge, but it's very inefficient to screen 111 million chemicals for only 10,000 signals. So we use what we call suspect lists, and this means that we can use prior knowledge. So for instance, if we've got wastewater and we've got a population of Luxembourg, we can use a list of the pharmaceuticals from the CNS in Luxembourg to screen for only the pharmaceutical medication that's allowed in Luxembourg in wastewater. That's 800 chemicals. It's a little bit numerically more efficient than 111 million. Some of these that are only produced in tiny amounts will never observe in our environment. Does it also mean that it's easier to screen for these in Luxembourg? Because, well, country is smaller, maybe the 
the emissions and production of such things is, is less than in bigger countries and more less influences from other i don't know actors or not it's it's population scaled so wastewater treatment plants uh usually uh only treat a subset of the population anyway so uh, obviously we don't have any that treat uh, tens of millions of people in the country because <laughs> our population is less um but no it's quite common that uh, there have about 20,000 to 40,000 people equivalents What we found that was very interesting is actually during the COVID pandemic, we had a paper looking at the pharmaceuticals. When everyone went into home office, actually the pharmaceutical concentrations in Luxembourg dropped quite a bit because all of our cross-border workers were suddenly no longer crossing the borders and coming to work during the day. We saw really a significant drop in a lot of pharmaceuticals, 2020 versus 2019. Also, um, a drop in the pharmaceuticals used in medical diagnostics that were um, on hold basically for almost an entire year while uh, while they were treating covid patients so so yes yeah, so yeah. it was a clear difference even at a smaller scale let's say right yes in yes, that sense absolutely. yeah absolutely yeah. and this was actually on on surface waters not even on the wastewater so i also know that at certain moment at least the news were often informing us about covid in the wastewater yes uh, were you also involved in that because that's targeted right It's targeted and it was also looking for the virus, not the chemicals. So no, we weren't directly involved because we're looking just for chemical signatures. Um, they, they were actually looking at the um, at the virus signatures. So that was uh, the list uh, that was doing that. Okay. Uh, but yeah, fascinating. Wastewater epidemiology has actually been around for a long time in in chemicals. So they've also been looking for uh, illicit drug use. Uh, you can do wastewater before and after. Uh, jails and find out how much uh, illicit drug is going on in, in jails. LNS actually does a lot of this work for um, for Luxembourg as well. And again, targeted because it's much more accurate than, than the untargeted. But also not only wastewater, I know about also a project called LaxPest. So that's focusing on pesticides. And yes. this is not in wastewater. This will be soil samples or not. This was actually surface waters as well. Oh, okay. Uh, Because uh, what's also interesting for us, uh, we have a very great collaboration with uh, Philip Diederich von Arge. He's been providing us with these surface water samples. Um, Lux Pest was actually my master's student, Jesse Kria, who uh, who did this analysis and, uh, and data analysis. It was fantastic work. Because for pesticides, these also um, transform once they hit the water. Very seasonal application, of course. So we were looking at uh, the time trends over the over the year. We have monthly samples. Uh, and you can really see in different months, different pesticides are coming and their transformation products as well. So yeah, that was a great, a great study. Is that analysis that you're making also then passed on to the regulatory bodies in a way kind of yes do they use it uh, later on to to check whether the the farmers for example in this case are using some some chemicals that should not be applied or not yes exactly so uh the routine targeted monitoring so this very accurate monitoring for the chemicals we know about this is going on at the at the ministry uh, so these surface waters are all under regular regular control and indeed these were exactly the same samples that were shared with us so that we can take a look and see if there's anything that they're missing and of course we communicate the results back because like we've already said the targeted is generally more accurate any concerning um, results they will also uh, add these chemicals to their monitoring list and make sure that those concentrations are, are monitored what i also have to say is that our methods are extremely extremely sensitive So we can also detect these chemicals, luckily, before they become a concern. But that's the reason we're working together to, to make sure we, we are aware of any chemicals that come up uh, that could be of a concern in the future. So why are they so sensitive? Is it because you're using all these uh, databases or what's the reason for that? So the mass spectrometers themselves are very uh, sensitive. So we've got a very sensitive sample prep, which is actually also done um, at Arj. Uh, so we really concentrate the sample down uh, many, many times. Uh, And then the mass spectrometers themselves can uh, take the smallest concentrations of chemical and already uh, we can get the mass signal and start to match them up with the masses. So, uh, yes, it's uh, partially the databases, but mainly the instrumentation is extremely sensitive now. And also this is why sharing of the information is so important that we have the latest uh, information out there in the databases to find it very efficiently. Absolutely. So Lux Pest uh, was exactly like this Lux Pharma. We had the CNS list, the Luxembourg pesticide list. We also took local knowledge of Luxembourg and also um, European pesticide regulations to, to form that list. 
you mentioned again the mass spectrometer. So just out of curiosity, how big is it? Because I have to say I have a bit of a background in nuclear physics. And one of the things that I managed to do with my father, who, who was actually expert in this field, was to visit an accelerator. So I have an idea of an accelerator and what happens with, you know, all the, when you, well, not watch, but kind of, you can visit. It's really like a physical spot that you can go to. What about the mass spectrometers? How, how big are they? I was going to say, I've been to CERN and seen the biggest one. <laughs> <laughs> so you beat me. I couldn't. Yeah. I mean, my father has done that, but no. I mean, for no, I was, was lucky. No... I worked in Switzerland, and we we were able to do a visit to CERN one day, and that's incredibly huge. No, mass spectrometers are thankfully a little bit smaller. <laughs> they fit in a normal lab. So our biggest one, which is not the one we usually use, is uh, about two meters by two meters. Uh, but usually they're quite a bit smaller than that, so it fits in a a normal lab room. Um, I mean, it can't. It wouldn't work in my office, but it would easily fit in your office. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, it's a reasonable size. So the they obviously, the, it depends on the model. The time of flights can sometimes have, this is the two meter one that has a bit longer because the, the distance is actually what's separating. Okay. And coming back to the discussion we've had on, on the on analysis. So let's say you collect a sample. You inject it, you said, right? You inject yep. it to the mass spectrometer. And then the data, what happens with that? It's not that you get like a printout of the data and you, an, no. you analyze it, you know. <laughs> actually, when I did my chem... When I did my chemistry, we d actually did have those uh, old, uh, my chemistry studies, we had those old printers where you had to cut out the peaks and weigh them to find out uh, how much of the chemical you had. No, these days it's all uh, it's all in big files. And as the instruments get more sensitive, the files uh, uh, go up and up in size. So uh, an average mass spec file is uh, several hundred megabytes uh, from some of the newer instruments over gigabytes worth of size. They come out generally in a vendor format. Um, so again, a closed format, um, but there are converters to put this into an open format. Uh, MZML is one of the most popular. Uh, and then we can extract uh, the numbers and it looks extraordinarily boring when you extract it. It's literally just a number with four decimal places next to a number that's very big, which is the intensity. And then we have to disambiguate these numbers and try and put chemical sense to these. Okay. And then how do you know what is relevant and what is not relevant? In this. So this is a great question. So you gave the example that we have one sample and we inject it and we get a file out. Um, and then we don't have any context to give us what's relevant except for our chemical lists. And we can use what I call the suspect list to screen. For example, if we're only interested in the pesticides, we would take our Lux pest list and look at pesticides in Luxembourg waters. If we're doing a true non-targeted, then you generally do a what's called a design of experiments. You set up control, blank samples, you set up uh, different conditions. So for Lux pest, we had, for instance, eight different locations in Luxembourg, different months. And then you can start to do a comparative analysis either between the locations or between the different months. Um, and start to use the the differences in the signal intensities. Uh, you know, if you see something that's very big in June that's suddenly gone in August, then this is very interesting. You'd want to know what that chemical is. Maybe it's only applied to the fields in June. Or, for instance, the pharmaceutical that was there in 2019 that wasn't there in 2020 anymore. Was it a medical imaging drug? Uh, was it a drug that's suddenly been banned for use for some reason? And we actually saw one that's actually been removed from the market in 2019 because it was they found side effects that they they stopped uh, marketing that drug. It, and that's why it was not registered anymore yep. in your... So, we, oh, okay. so the doctors stopped pres prescribing it, people stopped taking it, and then we didn't see um, see it in the water anymore. That's really so, great yes, to see such, such, such examples. And that's yeah. Luxembourg, of course, but I know also you cooperate on various thousands of different projects and different things. I know I don't know if you were involved in it, but I know that you often talk about the, the Rhine River life uh, monitoring yes. so this is also this is also quite an important project right for for the, the these type of uh, extremely studies. important yes so the rhine as this was um they they basically had a terrible incident uh in the 80s that stimulated this idea of continuous monitoring the technology for the non-target screening that we use today didn't exist in the 80s but um when it as soon as it became possible to do so indeed they started this non-targeted monitoring in 2014 so that basically means they take a daily uh, sample out of the Rhine. And this is something that actually shows how sensitive the methods are. I mean, the Rhine River has incredible dilution. So, um, but you can still start to see these chemical traces. They did the monitoring just outside Basel. Uh, and you can do the calculation, right? If they see a chemical that's suspicious that suddenly comes into the water in Basel, they have approximately two weeks to let uh, the next biggest city in Germany know. 
that is going to come down, uh, you know, so they can basically start to let Koblenz know, for instance, to switch off the water of Stuttgart. Uh, there's 20 million people who take their drinking water out of the Rhine. So they put this monitoring on to make sure there's no suspicious chemicals happening. And this goes with the detective work, right? We can even follow the chemicals, even if we don't know what they are. If you see a mass that suddenly appears over the threshold of 10 to the 6, which is extremely small concentrations in the Rhine, um, but still an extremely small concentration can mean a very high tonnage of chemical or kilograms worth of chemicals. You can still people tell people to look for that mass, even if we don't know what it is, and just make sure nothing happens until it's clarified. You can also start to trace that mass back further in the Rhine and start to see where it comes from and contact the industry. And there's been some brilliant examples of that where They've been able to find the industry. The industry has put in mitigation measures and the concentrations are down to levels that we can deal with. That's great. And that project uh, with Rhein, is it done by the environmental bodies or scientists in Germany? It was a, It's a collaboration. So it's both the Swiss and, uh, and the German government, mainly on the Swiss side. And it was a, a collaboration between the Swiss regulators and also EOWG, which is where I was at the time uh, as the research institute. And we were basically doing our research in a way that we could transfer it into a regulatory context and, and make sure that they could run at their side. Actually, very similar measures are happening now in the Rhine and the further down. So I'm in a, um, a board on the BFG. Uh, which is in Koblenz. We're doing very similar monitoring for the Rhine and the Mosel and, and the regions around here. Okay, so there's definitely more coming, let's say, um, but nothing like that uh, live monitoring of, of uh, rivers in Luxembourg yet. We're talking, though, with the German side because, uh, like we already learned from the Rhine, this was a single point in Basel. Um, they've extended it now to the entire Rhine basin. And what you can then start to do is really collect the data from uh, multiple locations and start to gain information. It's an incredible amount of effort to get such a platform working. So for a tiny country like Luxembourg, it's actually better if we could join either, let's just say, Dutch initiatives or the German initiatives. Uh, and we actually, there are conversations going on that we could actually just leverage the German platform uh, give advice as I try to do on, on some of the non-targeted while they're developing the platform and also hopefully contribute our samples as well. We also, you haven't asked the question yet, but we have the Norman network, which is a slightly less formalized. Um, it's not regulatory, but it is actually a network that gathers um, regulators, environmental laboratories, researchers, uh, interested parties. Um, we have several hundred members now. Uh, we also have a platform that we've been developing where we can share data and have a look at chemicals uh, throughout Europe. It's called the Digital Sample Freezing Platform, which has been fascinating as well. Digital free Sample freezing? freezing platform. Yeah. Why freezing? Well, because it was an analogy to if you set up a, a sample bank or a biobank, then you basically take a, a sample, a human sample, a soil sample, whatever, and you put it under some form of preservation and you record it so that people can go back later, take the sample and analyze it. With the digital freezing, we basically take a record of the sample as is uh, with the non-targeted methods. So we have basically that digital freezing of what it looks like now. Ideally, you also archive the sample as well so that if the technology improves, you could remeasure it. Um, but we basically have that frozen snapshot of this was the information we got with our technology today. And then you can start to do what we call retrospective screening over different years, different institutes start to see where these masses are turning up. Are they turning up actually in water and soil and fish? Or are they just turning up in, let's say, only fish and we've completely missed that chemical being problematic if we only look at the water? Um, all these kind of things. Just reminded me also uh, on another project that uh, I think you mentioned at a certain moment in one of the materials I was looking at, uh, monitoring the, the Black Sea and the influence yes. of the chemicals there. Can you tell us something more about that one? Yeah, so this was a project run by uh, Nikiforos Alikazakis and a lot of colleagues. I wasn't directly involved in it, um, but it has a beautiful screenshot because you can really see they did a, a transect throughout the, the Black Sea. And you can generally see very close to the very big cities, you see very high concentrations of chemicals. As you go further throughout the sea, they usually get uh, decrease or get lower. And there were some very funny hotspots in, in certain cases where some chemicals actually suddenly blipped up in the middle of the sea. But that, that has uh, given, because they had fish, they had soil, they had uh, the water as well, we started to get really great information about the different matrices that different chemicals occur. What, why funny hotspots? In what sense funny? Well, if you look at a map and you've got the blue sea uh, and you can see the coastline, you can see high concentrations at a coast, it makes sense to us. But if all of a sudden in the middle of the lake or the sea, you suddenly get a high concentration of a chemical, 
where there's no direct cause for it, it, it looks a bit odd. Does it mean that you try to investigate that or, or not? Exactly, yes, because any any occurrence of a high concentration that we can't explain, this would be something, of course, you'd want to investigate. Okay, so funny, but also interesting in that sense, right? Because yes. Then, yeah. yes. No, because if funny, you know, that's a, there are different definitions of funny, I guess, between scientists and, and, and other people. So, yeah, that was an interesting thing you said. Okay, so I think I'm kind of getting more or less the understanding of certain certain uh, databases and certain things you use. So you mentioned, of course, PubChem, you, ma- you mentioned Norman, but there's also some other thing. I mean, the suspect list, that's part of Norman as well? Yes, yes. Okay. So this is actually my main uh, project or role with the Norman network is that I'm actually the host of the Norman Suspect List Exchange. So I've been collecting these suspect lists of environmental knowledge that are relevant for our members uh, now since uh, 2015, which is quite a while. We haven't quite hit 100 lists yet, but we're close. Uh, we're very, very close. And it's been it's been fantastic. It's grown much further than we thought. Um, we have lists now anywhere between 40 chemicals, so very, very specialized lists, all the way to, through to 100,000 uh, chemicals, which is actually bigger than any suspect list we intended. This again becomes, it's effectively a database. It's not a little list of chemicals anymore. Of course, um, that's great. But, but then this suspect list exchange, sorry to interrupt you, the suspect list exchange is actually the collection of chemicals that feeds into that digital sample freezing platform. So that's why I always put that example up because the drop down menu of chemicals to screen is actually all coming from the data sets provided through the suspect list exchange. That's good you mentioned that because to be honest, it was difficult for me to understand the links because there are a lot of different players and different databases and some of them are actually subset of something. Some just cooperate and then the, the, the whole exchange is, is, is pretty vague if you look yes. at it for the first time. But just, yeah. I think we haven't mentioned that. So I think it's important as, as we've already discussed it. What is the suspect list? What are suspect substances, suspect screening and all that? Yeah, so uh, I can take the example of the pharmaceuticals again. So, you know, if you were screening our 10,000 peaks in, let's just say, uh, Luxembourg wastewater, and we would screen them against 111 million com pounds in PubChem. This is an extraordinary time-intensive calculation and you get far too many candidate candidates suggested back at you and you don't know where to start. So another way to do this more efficiently is like what my postdoc Randolph did. He took the CNS list, which is only 800. Then we kind of trimmed this down a bit to be the chemicals that we would see with our methods. So we have a certain mass range that we can measure. We don't see metals, for instance. Not that you want to be having metals taken as pharmaceuticals, but any that had metals in them, we can't see very well. Take out the salts. So a lot of pharmaceuticals have multiple components in them. So separated this out. And then we look for just these suspects in these, let's just say the 10,000 peaks. And that can be in a very efficient search. But still, it's just a match of a mass with the mass that we had in the instrument. So we still look at databases like PubChem to get supporting information. We look at the mass spectral libraries to see if it matches any known chemicals. So a suspect list can help quickly find masses that are very interesting especially if you don't have these different control situations like uh, decreasing, increasing concentrations. But we still have to verify everything. I don't know how much time we have left. I hope we have a bit. But we actually, with PubChem, we've actually been working on a subset of PubChem. We call it PubChem Lite. And this has actually been a subset of PubChem that has very detailed annotation content. It has a lot of literature values. It has a lot of patent values. Um, We also know if things have got annotation content in PubChem saying whether they're a pharmaceutical or an agrochemical or food or some major categories, whether they've been associated with diseases and disorders. So instead of screening the entire 111 million, we can use um, this much smaller database. We hit actually 400,000 just last week. So we can search these 400,000 chemicals. We get many fewer candidates back and they tell us why they're interesting for us. So then we can see, okay, this chemical is only registered in the US. It's not so relevant for our European samples. Oh, this one's registered in Europe. Okay. It's probably much more interesting for us. So it's eventually some kind of a filtering method to only use the relevant resources to analyze. Exactly. And if you really want to identify the true unknowns, this is a whole other level of elucidation that uh, you you wouldn't go to the known chemical databases. You sit down with the mass spectrum and try to interpret it and, and see if that structure is even in the database. So. And you might spend your whole lifetime trying to identify something like that, I guess. Exactly. So it really depends on, on the, the study question, what are you trying to get out of the sample? And usually for water, we're trying to look for known chemicals, uh, make sure that the public health is is guaranteed and also the health of the environment. And then you're generally looking for known chemicals uh, and quick action. Yeah, which just leads me to another question. Why bother? Why look for the unknowns? 
because we need to find the chemicals before they become problematic. So what's been told over and over, or time has told over and over again, is that as the chemicals are being produced, we're finding out the environmental effects with a, a really dramatic lag time. So we're trying to become much more proactive in this manner, trying to detect them as soon as possible, notice where the concentration is increasing and see if action has to be taken before we actually have a real problem. And what I also understood in a way looking at LCSB's work is that you would like to see whether certain maybe unknown chemicals or transformations have influence later on on developing diseases. Yes, yep. So neurodegeneration is is one of the focuses of LCSB. And here again, this was one of the reasons for the Lux pest, because uh, pesticides has actually have actually been associated with the onset of Parkinson's disease. So yes, we're trying to investigate whether, A, whether the pesticides, what are the mechanisms that the pesticides could affect. Uh, we're hoping to get some studies started on that. And we're also looking at what pesticides are around. Could this possibly have influenced any disease progression that's already happening because the, the stimulating event in a neurodegenerative disease can be decades before we actually see the health effects. So again, this also points towards us trying to identify problematic chemicals uh, far before we actually see the effects because by then it's too late for many, many people. And it also points us toward the idea of open science as such and the ex you know, the, the exchange between scientists, because, well, if, if you just close yourself up somewhere and try to do it on your own, I mean, I don't think you're going to get far if you don't have that exchange, right? Is this one of the reasons why you're advocating for open science or why is it yeah, important is, for you? Yeah, this is my main reason. I've, shown, I've seen how closed science can really uh, endanger our environmental uh, protection let's just say and uh, the sharing of the information is so critical and and it's exactly like you said one person can't change everything but by sharing the information between people we can put the chemicals out there so that the researchers who actually have the samples let's just say the latest PFAS they can make sure they can find that PFAS chemical as soon as possible in their samples we've actually been working with collaborators who don't know so well how to get the information out there but I know how to provide that information to the databases to make it public so we're trying to work with different people show them how they can how they can get the data out there. One of the best examples we have is a, a Spanish student. Uh, we put his collision cross-section values. We haven't discussed that today, but this is basically um, complementary to mass spectrometry. You can me measure the size of the molecules, so the cross-section. He uploaded his data set uh, with us. We had a thousand downloads of his data set before his paper was accepted, which was just amazing for a young student to get so much attention to his data set uh, before we had the paper accepted and afterwards it's, it's obviously just gone through the roof. His data's out there and being used and publicly available in many places now. Yeah, that's really brilliant, you know, that kind of lets you also uh, experience this this whole idea of exchange in a, in a completely different level rather than just waiting for the reviews to come and all the scientific community vetting on, on, on your uh, abilities or not, right? Yeah, we had a very interesting conversation with a postdoc who, who couldn't make it. She's got a fantastic position in, in America now. Um, she was American. She was doing uh, PFAS research on seabirds, and she was saying, you know, the latest PFAS, that they're basically only just producing them. They're, they're already seeing them in seabirds around the world because they would take a stop close to that one factory that produces this chemical uh, on their migration routes, and then within a year it's spread around the world. And hearing stories like that, you know, it's just so critical to get the latest information out there so that people can find it and identify these problems. Yeah. Absolutely. Also, because in this day and age, the information exchange is fast. So if you also don't catch up with the scientific uh, information and the data, we're just not going to prevent such such events from happening. You keep coming back to PFAS and PFAS and PFAS at the end of our discussion. So now <laughs> I think it's the time. Maybe you're leading, you're telling me, Hannah, we have to finish now. So let's just reveal the answer. I was going to say I could talk for hours, so we can easily talk for hours, but I can uh, so with uh, I can reveal the answer, of course. With PFAS lists, uh, we've actually we host several on the Norman Suspect List Exchange. We have lists anywhere between hundreds and uh, I think our biggest list is 4,700 chemicals. Um, the Comtox dashboard from the EPA, they host several lists and their largest estimate is around 10,000. When we did this same search on PubChem, we actually came up with over 6 million chemicals that fit the new definition, this which is, is incredible. This is really it's humongous, incredible. to use maybe a word that fits it very well, right? Yeah. yeah. And this means so, yeah. that... With the new regulation, all these will be uh, 
banned? No, Re regulated in a different way. Or not. Regulated in a different way, yes. And there's uh, there's a huge debate. Of course, a lot of these chemicals have only been produced in tiny amounts. Uh, they're combinatorial libraries for pharmaceutical screening, let's just say. What is also being discussed is um, the essential use concept. So is this chemical essential? Is it non-essential? If it's non-essential, can it be replaced with something else? If it's essential also, can it be replaced with something else? And until not, then maybe we should still use it. One of the, well, the industry that's quite affected by it is um, the CF3 group happens to improve the efficacy of um, pharmaceuticals quite a bit. So if we would suddenly ban this structure from pharmaceuticals, it could be quite problematic. Uh, one of the um, newest chemicals for COVID is actually a PFAS, as it was released only a few months ago. So it's it's a regulation that could have a lot of uh, impacts. Uh, and obviously, dealing with a list of 6 million chemicals is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Even the 10,000 was too many for regulators. So it's going to be very interesting to see how we deal with this concept. Did you expect that to be around that number or not? I was going to say, discussing with my PubChem colleague, we kind of had an idea it would be this high and certainly far higher than, than the lists. Um, the challenges, of course, like we mentioned with, with PubChem Light and subsetting it with the metadata, what is the evidence out there that this is actually being produced in large concentrations? Is it in patents? Um, is it in, in the literature? Has it been found? Has it been documented? And just to actually get back to to where you were before, uh, you know, extracting the information from the literature as quickly as possible. We've actually been working with um, chem informatics consultants uh, to look at, and with Google patents, to look at how can we extract uh, the this information from patents effectively to get these chemicals into the database and actually start start this whole cycle of, of knowledge. So our biggest upload to PubChem was actually 1.8 million PFAS chemicals extracted from patents uh, a few weeks ago. So. That's great. And that probably means some kind of um, automation, machine learning algorithms Absolutely. to extract that data yeah. or not. Keywords, search. Yes. Something like that. Keyword, keyword searching. So with chemicals, the challenge is, of course, you've got names, you've got identifiers like these CAS numbers and the CAS library being closed. We can't always associate the CAS number with the structure. You have to have image extraction. So people, a lot of times they will draw the chemicals. And then, of course, with any image extraction, you've got errors happening with arrows and numbers. Uh, so apparently uh, iodine is very overrepresented because uh, they often name the figure I uh, in Roman numerals. So I, I, I. <laughs> and so on and so on. So you get uh, typical um, errors happening that you have to try and uh, eliminate. But again, if, if the structures are out there openly available, people can start to reconcile them with the experimental information like we try to do. And then over time, you start to see, okay, these are the signals that are coming up everywhere. These are the masses that are coming up everywhere. We don't have a clue what it is, but it's happening all through Europe. So maybe we'd better find out. This is okay. where big data and AI start to help. Yes. Yeah, of course. There's always uh, during this podcast, even if I'm not trying to, there is a moment when we have to discuss some of the latest technologies because, well, it's it's so present in science and we can't avoid it. And hopefully it's just only going to help us uh, extract more, exchange more, find more. And with this positive approach, uh, I think we're going to uh, slowly head to the end of the podcast. Um, I was really happy to to hear all your opinion. I think I got a little bit more now. I think I'm, I'll be able to understand what LCSB is doing a bit more and also to discuss with, with, with other people. But for sure, I think uh, what I would like our listeners to, to, to leave, uh, I mean, what, what kind of an idea uh, I would like them to have is is just this whole idea of of uh, open science and exchange. And of course, I guess uh, people listening to this podcast are not necessarily scientists exchanging the knowledge, but even us, as as you, you know, not normal people, we can advocate that it's really important that this is all open and and freely available because there is no reason for it not to be. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Our guest today was Professor Emma Szymański. Thank you very much for having me. This is it for today. I hope you enjoyed the show. As usual, don't forget to follow, subscribe on Twitter, LinkedIn, write us an email, drop us a message wherever is more convenient for you. We are always on the lookout for new guests on our show or just ideas of different research projects that are happening in Luxembourg. This was Silax, and my name is Hanna Szymaszko. <laughs>